The Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith Part 1 of the Propriety of Actions, consisting of three sections. Section 3 of the Effects of Prosperity and Adversity upon the Judgment of Mankind with Regard to the Propriety of Action, and why it is more easy to obtain their approbation in the one state than in the other. Chapter 2 of the origin of ambition and of the distinction of ranks. It is because mankind are disposed to sympathize more entirely with our joy than with our sorrow, that we make a parade of our riches and conceal our poverty. Nothing is so mortifying as to be obliged to expose our distress of the view of the public and to feel that though our situation is open to the eyes of all mankind, no mortal conceives for us the half of what we suffer Nay, it is chiefly from this regard to the sentiments of mankind that we pursue riches and avoid poverty. For to what purpose is all the toil and bustle of this world? What is the end of this avarice and ambition, of the pursuit of wealth, of power, and preeminence? Is it to supply the necessities of nature? The wages of the meanest labor can supply them. We see that they afford him food and clothing, and the comfort of a house, and of a family. If we examined his economy with rigor, we should find that he spends a great part of them upon conveniencies which may be regarded as superfluities, and that, upon extraordinary occasions, he can give something even to vanity and distinction. What then is the cause of our aversion to his situation, and why should those who have been educated in the higher ranks of life regard it as worse than death, to be reduced to life, even without labor, upon the same simple fare with him, to dwell under the same lowly roof, and to be clothed in the same humble attire. Do they imagine that their stomach is better, or their sleep is sounder in a palace than in a cottage? The contrary has been so often observed, and, indeed, is so very obvious, though it has never been observed that there is nobody ignorant of it. From whence, then, arises that emulation which runs through all the different ranks of men, and what are the advantages which we propose by that great purpose of human life, which we call bettering our condition? To be observed, to be attended to, to take notice of with sympathy, complacency, and approbation, are all the advantages which we can propose to derive from it. It is the vanity, not the ease, or the pleasure, which interests us. But the vanity is always founded upon the belief of our being the object of attention and approbation. The rich man glories in his riches because he feels that they naturally draw upon him the attention of the world and that mankind are disposed to go along with him in all those agreeable emotions with which the advantages of his situation so readily inspire him. At the thought of this, his heart seems to swell and dilate itself within him, and he is fonder of his wealth upon this account than for all the other advantages it procures him. The poor man, on the contrary, is ashamed of his poverty. He feels that it either places him out of sight of mankind, or that if they have taken any notice of him, they have, however, scarce any fellow feeling with his misery and distress which he suffers. He is mortified upon both accounts, for though to be overlooked and to be disapproved of are things entirely different, yet as obscurity covers up from the daylight of honor and approbation, to feel that we are taken no notice of necessarily damps the most agreeable hope and disappoints the most ardent desire of human nature. The poor man goes out and comes in unheeded, and when in the midst of a crowd, is in the same obscurity, as if shut up in his own hovel. Those humble cares and painful attentions which occupy those in his situation afford no amusement to the dissipated and the gay. They turn away their eyes from him, or if the extremity of his distress forces them to look at him, it is only to spurn so disagreeable an object from among them. The fortunate and the proud wonder at the insolence of the human wretchedness that it should dare to present itself before them, and, with the loathsome aspect of its misery, presume to disturb the serenity of their happiness. The man of rank and distinction, on the contrary, is observed by all the world. Everybody is eager to look at him, and to conceive, at least by sympathy, that joy and exultion with which his circumstances naturally inspire him. His actions are the objects of the public care. Scarce a word, scarce a gesture, can fall from him that is altogether neglected. In a great assembly, he is the person upon whom all direct their eyes. It is upon him that their passions seem all to wait with expectation. In order to receive that movement and direction, which he shall impress upon them, 
and if his behavior is not altogether absurd, he has every moment an opportunity of interesting mankind and rendering himself the object of the observation and fellow feeling of everybody about him. It is this which notwithstanding the restraint it imposes, notwithstanding the loss of liberty with which it is attended, renders greatness the object of envy and compensates in the opinion of all those mortifications which must mankind, all that toil, all that anxiety, be undergone in the pursuit of it, and what is yet more consequence, all that leisure, all that ease, all that careless security, which is forfeited forever by the acquisition. When we consider the condition of the great in those delusive colors in which the imagination is apt to paint it, it seems to be almost the abstract idea of a perfect happy state. It is the very state which, in all our waking dreams and idle reveries, we had sketched out to ourselves as the final object of all our desires. We feel, therefore, a peculiar sympathy with the satisfaction of those who are in it. We favor all their inclinations and forward all their wishes. What pity, we think, that anything should spoil and corrupt so agreeable a situation. We could even wish them immortal, and it seems hard to us that death should at last put an end to such a perfect enjoyment. It is cruel, we think, in nature to compel them from their exalted stations to that humble but hospital home, which she has provided for all her children. Great King, live forever, is the compliment which after the manner of the Eastern adulation we should readily make of them. If experience did not teach us its absurdity, every calamity that befalls them, every injury that has done them, excites in the breast of the spectator ten times more compassion and resentment than he would have felt had the same things happened to other men. It is the misfortunes of kings only which afford the proper subjects for tragedy. They resemble in this respect the misfortune of lovers. Those two situations are the chief which interest us upon the theatre, because in spite of all the reason and experience can tell us to the contrary, the prejudices of the imagination attach to these two states a happiness superior to any other. To disturb or to put an end to such perfect enjoyment seems to be the most atrocious of all injuries. The traitor who conspires against the life of his monarch is thought a greater monster than any other murderer. All the innocent blood that was shed in the civil wars provoked less indignation than the death of Charles I. A stranger to human nature, who saw the indifference of men about the misery of their inferiors, and the regret and indignation which they feel for the misfortunes and sufferings of those above them, would be apt to imagine that pain must be more agonizing and the convulsions of death more terrible to persons of higher rank than to those of the meaner stations. Upon this disposition of mankind, to go along with the passions of the rich and the powerful, is founded the distinction of ranks and the order of society. Our obsequious to our superiors more frequently arises from our admiration for the advantages of their situation than from any private expectations of benefit from their goodwill. Their benefits can extend, but to a few, but their fortunes interest almost everybody. We are eager to assist them in completing the system of happiness that approaches so near to perfection, and we desire to serve them for their own sake, without any other recompense but the vanity or honor of obliging them. Neither is our deference to their inclinations founded chiefly or altogether upon a regard to the utility of such submission, and to the order of society which is best supported by it. Even when the order of society seems to require that we should oppose them, we can hardly bring ourselves to do it. That kings are the servants of the people, to be obeyed, resisted, deposed, or punished, as the public conveniency may require, is the doctrine of reason and philosophy, but it is not the doctrine of nature. Nature would teach us to submit to them for their own sake, to tremble and to bow down before their exalted station, to regard their smile as a reward sufficient to compensate any services, and to dread their own displeasure, though no evil were to follow from it. As the severest of all mortifications, to treat them in any respect as men, to reason and dispute with them upon ordinary occasions, requires such resolution that there are few men whose magnanimity can support them in it, unless they are likewise assisted by familiarity and acquaintance. The strongest motives, the most furious passions, fear, hatred, and resentment are scarce sufficient to balance this nature disposition to respect them, and their conduct must, either justly or unjustly, 
have excited the highest degree of all those passions, before the bulk of the people can be brought to oppose them with violence, or to desire to see them either punished or deposed. Even when the people have been brought to this length, they are apt to relent every moment and easily relapse into their habitual state of deference to those whom they have been accustomed to look upon as their natural superiors. They cannot stand the mortification of their monarch. Compassion soon takes the place of resentment, they forget all past provocations, their old principles of loyalty revive, and they run to re-establish the ruined authority of their old masters with the same violence with which they had opposed it. The death of Charles I brought about the restoration of the royal family. Compassion for James II when he was seized by the populace in making his escape on shipboard had almost prevented the revolution and made it go on more heavily than before. Do the great seem insensible of the easy price at which they may acquire the public admiration? Or do they seem to imagine that to them, as to other men, it must be the purchase either of sweat or blood? By what important accomplishments is the young nobleman instructed to support the dignity of his rank and to render himself worthy of that superiority over his fellow citizens, to which the virtue of his ancestors had raised them? Is it by knowledge, by industry, by patience, by self-denial, or by virtue of any kind? As all his words, as all his motions, are attended to, he learns an habitual regard for every circumstance of ordinary behavior, and studies to perform all those small duties with which the most exact propriety, as he is conscious how much he is observed, and how much mankind are disposed to favor all its inclinations, he acts, upon the most indifferent occasions, with that freedom and elevation which the thought of this naturally inspires. His air, his manner, his deportment, all mark that elegant and graceful sense of his own superiority, which those who are born to inferior stations can hardly ever arrive at. These are the arts by which he proposes to make mankind more easily submit to his authority, and to govern their inclinations according to his own pleasure, and in this he is seldom disappointed. These arts, supported by the rank and preeminence, are, upon ordinary occasions, sufficient to govern the world. Louis the Fourteenth, during the greater part of his reign, was regarded not only in France, but all over Europe as the most perfect model of a great prince. But what were the talents and virtues by which he acquired this great reputation? Was it by the scrupulous and inflexible justice of all his undertakings, by the immense dangers and difficulties with which they were attended, or by the unwearied and unrelenting application with which he pursued them? Was it by his extensive knowledge, by his exquisite judgment, or by his heroic valor? It was by none of these qualities, but he was, first of all, the most powerful prince in Europe, and consequently held the highest rank among kings. And then, says his historian, he surpassed all his courtiers in the gracefulness of his shape and the majestic beauty of his features. The sound of his voice, noble and affecting, gained those hearts which his presence intimidated. He had a step and a deportment which could suit only him and his rank, and which would have been ridiculous in any other person. The embarrassment which he occasioned to those who spoke to him flattered that secret satisfaction with which he felt his own superiority. The old officer, who was confounded and faltered in asking him a favor, and not being able to conclude his discourse, said to him, Sir, your majesty, I hope will believe that I do not tremble thus before your enemies, had no difficulty to obtain what he demanded. These frivolous accomplishments, supported by his ranks, and no doubt too, by a degree of other talents and virtues, which seems, however, not to have been much above mediocrity, established this prince in the esteem of his own age, and have drawn, even from posterity, a good deal of respect for his memory. Compared with these, in his own times, and in his own presence, no other virtue, it seems, appeared to have any merit. Knowledge, industry, valor, beneficence trembled, were abashed, and lost all dignity before them. But it is not by accomplishments of this kind that the man of inferior rank must hope to distinguish himself. Politeness is so much the virtue of the great that it will do little honor to anybody but themselves. The coxcomb, who imitates their manner and affects to be eminent by the superior propriety of his ordinary behavior, is rewarded with a double share of contempt for his folly and presumption. Why should the man whom nobody thinks it worth while to look at be very anxious about the manner in which he holds up his head, or disposes his arms, while he walks through a room. He is occupied surely with a very superfluous attention, 
and with an attention to the Marxist sense of his own importance, which no other mortal can go along with. The most perfect modesty and plainness, joined to as much negligence as is consistent with the respect due to the company, ought to be the chief characteristics of the behavior of a private man. If he ever hopes to distinguish himself, it must be by more important virtues. He must acquire dependence to balance the dependence of the great, and he has no other fund to pay them from but the labor of his body and the activity of his mind. He must cultivate these, therefore. He must acquire superior knowledge in his profession and superior industry in the exercise of it. He must be patient in labor, resolute in danger, and firm in distress. These talents he must bring into public view by the difficulty, importance, and at the same time good judgment of his undertakings, and by the severe and unrelenting application with which he pursues them. Probity and prudence, generosity and frankness, must characterize his behavior upon all ordinary occasions, and he must, at the same time, be forward to engage in all those situations, in which it requires the greatest talents and virtues to act with propriety, but in which the greatest applause is to be acquired by those who can acquit themselves with honor. With what impatience does the man of spirit and ambition, who is depressed by his situation, look round for some great opportunity to distinguish himself? No circumstances which can afford this appear to him undesirable. He even looks forward with satisfaction to the prospect of born war, or civil dissension, and, with secret transport and delight, sees through all the confusion and bloodshed which attend them, and the probability of those wished-for occasions presenting themselves, in which he may draw upon himself the attention and admiration of mankind. The man of rank and distinction, on the contrary, whose whole glory consists of the propriety of his ordinary behavior, who is contented with the humble renown which this can afford him, and has no talents to acquire any other, is unwilling to embarrass himself, with what can be attended either with difficulty or distress. To figure at a ball is his great triumph, and to succeed in an intrigue of gallantry, his highest exploit. He has an aversion to all public confusions, not from the love of mankind, for the great never look upon their inferiors as their fellow creatures, nor yet from the want of courage, for in that he is seldom defective, but from a consciousness that he possesses none of the virtues which are required in such situations, and that the public attention will certainly be drawn away from him by others, he may be willing to expose himself to some little danger, and to make a campaign when it happens to be the fashion, but he shudders with horror at any thought of any situation which demands the continual and long exertion of patience, industry, fortitude, and application of thought. These virtues are hardly ever to be met in men who are born to those high stations. In all governments accordingly, even in monarchies, the highest offices are generally possessed, and the whole detail of administration conducted by men who were educated in the middle and inferior ranks of life, who have been carried forward by their own industry and abilities, though loaded with the jealousy and opposed by the resentment of all those who were born their superiors, and to whom the great after having regarded them with their first contempt and afterwards with envy, are at last contented to truckle with the same abject meanness with which they desire that the rest of mankind should behave to themselves. It is the loss of this easy empire over the affections of mankind which renders the fall from greatness so insupportable. When the family of the king of Macedon was led in triumph by Paulus Aemilius, their misfortunes, it is said, made them divide with their conqueror the attention of the Roman people. The sight of the royal children, whose tender age rendered them insensible of their situation, struck the spectators amidst the public rejoicings and prosperity with the tenderest sorrow and compassion. The king appeared next in the procession, and seemed like one confounded and astonished, and bereft of all sentiment by his greatness of his calamities. His friends and ministers followed after him. As they moved along, they often cast their eyes upon their fallen sovereign, and always burst into tears at the sight, their whole behavior demonstrating that they thought not of their own misfortunes, but they were occupied entirely by the superior greatness of his. The generous Romans, on the contrary, beheld him with disdain and indignation, and regarded as unworthy of all compassion the man who could be so mean-spirited as to bear to live under such calamities. Yet what did those calamities amount to? According to the great part of historians, 
he was to spend the remainder of his days, under the protection of a powerful and humane people, in a state which in itself should be pretty worthy of envy, a state of plenty, ease, leisure, and security, from which it was impossible for him, even by his own folly, to fall. But he was no longer to be surrounded by that admiring mob of fools, flatterers, and dependents, who had formerly been accustomed to attend upon all his motions. He was no longer to be gazed upon by multitudes, nor to have it in his power to render himself the object of their respect, their gratitude, their love, their admiration. The passions of nations were no longer to mould themselves upon his inclinations. This was that insupportable calamity which bereaved the king of all sentiment, which made his friends forget their own misfortunes, and which the Roman magnanimity could scarce conceive how any man could be so mean-spirited as to bear to survive. Love, says my lord Rochefoucauld, is commonly succeeded by ambition, but ambition is hardly ever succeeded by love. That passion, when once it has got the entire possession of the breast, will admit neither a rival nor successor. To those who have been accustomed to the possession or even to the hope of public admiration, all other pleasures sicken and decay. Of all the discarded statesmen, who for their own ease have studied to get the better of ambition and to despise those honours which they could no longer arrive at, how few have been able to succeed. The greater part have spent their time in the most listless and insipid indolence, chagrined at the thoughts of their own insignificancy, incapable of being interested in the occupations of private life, without enjoyment except when they talked of their former greatness and without satisfaction, except when they were employed in some vain project to recover it. Are you in earnest resolved never to barter your liberty for the lordly servitude of a court, but to live free, fearless and independent? There seems to be one way to continue in that virtuous resolution, and perhaps but one. Never enter the place from whence so few have been able to return. Never come within the circle of ambition, nor ever bring yourself into the comparison with those masters of the earth, who have already engrossed the attention of half mankind before you. Of such mighty importance does it appear to be, in the imaginations of men, to stand in the situation which sets them most in the view of general sympathy and attention, and thus place that great object which divides the wives of the older men is the end of half the laborers of human life, and is the cause of all the tumult and bustle, all the rapine and injustice, which avarice and ambition have introduced into this world. People of sense, it is said, indeed despise place, that is, they despise sitting at the head of the table, and are indifferent who it is that is pointed out to the company by that frivolous circumstance, which the smallest advantage is capable of overbalancing. But rank, distinction, preeminence, no man despises, unless he is either raised to be much above or sunk very much below. The ordinary standards of human nature, unless he is either so confirmed in wisdom and real philosophy as to be satisfied that while the propriety of his conduct renders him the just object of approbation, it is of little consequence, though, he be either attended to nor approved of, or so habituated to the idea of his own meanness, so sunk in slothful and sottish indifference, as entirely to have forgot the desire and almost the very wish for superiority, as to become the natural object of the joyous congratulations and sympathetic attentions of mankind, is, in this manner, the circumstances which gives to prosperity all its dazzling splendor. So nothing darkens so much the gloom of adversity as to feel that our misfortunes are the objects not of the fellow feeling, but of the contempt and the aversion of our brethren. It is upon this account that the most dreadful calamities are not always those which it is most difficult to support. It is often more mortifying to appear in public under small disasters than under great misfortunes. The first excite no sympathy, but the second, though they may excite none, that approaches to the anguish of the sufferer, call forth, however, a very lively compassion. The sentiments of the spectators are, in this last case, less wide of those of the sufferer, and their imperfect fellow feeling lends him some assistance in supporting his misery. Before a gay assembly, a gentleman would be more mortified to appear covered with filth and rags than with blood and wounds. This last situation would interest their pity. The other would provoke their laughter. The judge who orders a criminal to be set in the pillory dishonors him more than if he had condemned him to the scaffold. 
the great prince who some years ago came to general officer at the head of his army disgraced him irrecoverably the punishment would have been much less had he shot him through the body by the laws of honor to strike with a cane dishonors to strike with a sword does not for an obvious reason those slighter punishments when inflicted on a gentleman to whom dishonor is the greatest of all evils comes to be regarded among a humane and generous people as the most dreadful of any with regard to persons of that rank therefore they are universally laid aside and the law while it takes their life upon many occasions respects their honor upon almost all to scourge a person of quality or to set him into the pillory upon account of any crime whatever is a brutality of which no european government except that of russia is capable a brave man is not rendered contemptible by being brought to the scaffold he is by being set in the pillory his behavior in the one situation may gain him universal esteem and admiration no behavior in the other can render him agreeable the sympathy of the spectators supports him in the one case and saves him from that shame the consciousness that his misery is felt by him himself only which is of all sentiments upon the most unsupportable there is no sympathy in the other or if there is any it is not with his pain which is a trifle but with his consciousness of the want of sympathy with which his pain is attended it is with his shame not with his sorrow those who pity him blush and hang down their heads for him he droops in the same manner and feels himself irrecoverably degraded by the punishment though not by the crime the man on the contrary who dies with resolution as he is naturally regarded with the erect aspect of esteem and approbation so he wears himself the same undaunted countenance and if the crime does not deprive him of the respect of others the punishment never will he has no suspicion that his situation is the object of contempt or derision to anybody and he can with propriety assume the air not only of perfect serenity but of triumph and exultation great dangers says the cardinal de retz have their charms because there is some glory to be got even when we miscarry but moderate dangers have nothing but what is horrible because the loss of reputation always attends the want of success his maxim has the same foundation with what we have been just now observing with regard to punishments human virtues is superior to pain to poverty to danger and to death nor does it even require the utmost efforts to despise them but to have its misery exposed to insult and derision to be led in triumph to be set up for the hand of the scorn to point at is a situation in which its constancy is much more apt to fail compared with the contempt of mankind all other external evils are easily supported